So I invite the panelists to, to switch on their, their cameras. We will now start with the celebrations of the International Day of Light 2022. And I have the pleasure to, to have celebrate this event with uh, certain invited speakers, all working at INL in different research uh, positions, different research unit, and then different research careers, uh, levels of their careers, uh, from current PhD students to research engineers, facility managers, staff researchers, um, to um, fellows, postdoctoral fellows with prestigious grants that joined INL, and um, myself, a research group leader that is happy also to participate in the roundtable discussion later on if you have any questions to uh, concerning our careers, our career uh, choices, or how do, did we get where we are right now and where will we like to go. Um, the agenda of today is uh, comprising a short welcome. Then um, we will introduce why we are celebrating the International Day of Flight and what it is. Uh, we will talk about INL, uh, what is INL, a research organization, an intergovernmental research organization located in Braga in Portugal. And then um, our invited speakers will give their inspirational talks. Uh, this will be uh, about 10 to 12 minutes long and you will have the chance to uh, ask some questions. Um, you can ask the questions uh, via the question um, chat box uh, on the bottom of your screen. And you can either direct them to everyone or just to the host and panelist, and I will be able then to read them out and, and ask your questions in your name to the panelists, to the different speakers. Um, after the inspirational talks, we will hear um, uh, Mariana, the facility manager of the nanophotonics and bioimaging facility to speak about our nano, yeah, our facilities that are in open access mode. So if you are at INL or not at INL, both ways you will be able to actually access these instruments. And Mariana will also provide some inspiring works that were published by INL researchers using in parts the equipments that we have at hand in optical microscopy and spectroscopy. And so you get an overview of what can be done and, and how to, yeah, to, to get access to those. Um, in the very end, it is about asking us questions and we ask among ourselves questions in the round table, table discussion. And then there will be a quiz with a nice prize that is still, of course, a secret. So you will see uh, what <laughs> the winner will be surprised. <laughs> um, to start, um, the Day of Light event is celebrated and uh, initiated by the UNESCO. And um, it was decided that this is typically celebrated on May 16th. Now we celebrate one week later because we had an important microscopy workshop happening at INL last week, which was focused on the electron microscopy. Um, but the 16th of May is important for photonics and especially um, for a lot of different technologies that we use daily as this was the first day that a laser was successfully oper operated in 1960 by Theodore Maiman. And such a laser, we know it from um, different applications in daily life. If it is the laser in, in a CD player to a laser used in communications, in healthcare to, um, to for example, um, uh, treat your eyes or whether it is used in the imaging of tissue, uh, you will see that this is a perfect example where photonics or the science of light comes up with a technology that is uh, entering many, many um, applications of our daily lives. And of course, um, we think that the science of light and the understanding of light can be used in many different challenges that lie ahead. And as you all know, we have the um, sustainable development goals formulated the 17th that we uh, try to address in our research and in many of the funded European funded programs where we aim to have impacts in 
reducing poverty, reducing hunger, improving the health and well-being, and so on and so on. And as you might notice, the label of the International Day of Light symbol is represented by the Sustainable Development Goals. It is believed that light can help in all these matters uh, as we have cross-cutting technologies that can be used in so many different sectors. And as we all know, light is the source of energy and the, the source of um, um, yeah, yeah, uh, energy and life on Earth. Um, in this sense, you can see that the logo was merging the 17 development goals and this is combining with the sun symbolizing light. Um, what we do at INL with light, of course, is not always um, visible to the naked eye. Rather, we work with nanostructures that are being fabricated that have interesting properties. We will hear something about nanostructuring materials for light applications in our first talk by Diogo, also about nanostructuring using lasers in the talk by Beatrice. And if you would like to have a peek into our lab and the machines we work with to actually uh, fabricate or characterize light-based um, research, you can access one of these videos that are published on the channel of the INL, the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory, and you will be able to to see some of our examples there, or you just carefully listen to some of the talks today. Of course, we are not the only ones that celebrate the International Day of Light, rather it is a, a celebrated worldwide, and um, uh, including, uh, of course, in several locations in Portugal. We have been celebrating the Day of Light since 2016, uh, here you can see some of the pictures of the groups that were visiting INL in frame of the celebration. And um, since 2020, of course, we had to change the format a little bit. And so our first webinars were in yeah, 2020 and in 2021. And we were quite happy with the, yeah, this format and decided to continue also seen in yeah, the yeah, Corona pandemic still ongoing. Um, to, to host this event again as a um, yeah, webinar access open to, to everyone worldwide uh, to follow us. Our speakers today will be Diogo Aguiam, Beatrice Costa, Miguel Xavier, Maria João uh, Lopez and Mariana Cavallo. And um, before they introduce and tell you about the different context of their studies, we would like you to get prepared um, that there will be a quiz about some of the questions and items that will be discussed. And um, if you would like to participate, I will show this later on again, but please go to this website quizzes.com or simply use your smartphone and you can scan this QR code to directly enter the quiz. So I will show the slide later on once more, but um, this will be helpful for you to know that you, um, if you are interested in winning today, <laughs> play, pay attention and um, yeah, and this is the access code for you to participate. Um, I mentioned this abbreviation INL now several times and um, I'm sure many of you know INL already, but some of you don't. So I will shortly introduce our organization. INL is an intergovernmental research and technology organization. It's called the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory because we are located on the Iberian Peninsula and we were founded by the two member states, Portugal and Spain. We are um, aiming to be yeah, a leading worldwide partner for science and innovation in nanotechnologies. And um, we do that by working in a very interdisciplinary manner. You will also see from the selection of speakers today that the background of the researchers is very different from material engineers to chemists, physicists, and uh, life science uh, researchers. And um, we address in our institute um, different challenges that uh, try to address the sustainable development goals that I already mentioned with the focus on the areas of health, food, environment, energy, information and communication technologies, as well as new future emerging technologies where we control matter on the 
nano or even on the atomic scale to create new properties and materials and then potentially use these technologies or materials in technologies that we don't even yet know about, that we cannot even yet imagine. To do so in the most effective way, uh, three years ago, we decided to work in so-called research clusters. These research clusters are aiming to develop ambitious goals in the areas of food. It's called future, future, where it symbolizes that we need uh, new technologies um, to uh, sustain and, and to deliver food uh, at a healthy and a sustainable way. Precise personalized health tech, where nanotechnology uh, can contribute in new therapeutics or diagnostic tools. Clean energy, then the clean environment, uh, sustainable environment, the smart digital nanosystems cluster, as well as the advanced materials and computing clusters. And you can see that many research groups are contributing to these clusters. Sometimes a research group is actually associated to multiple clusters, not only to one. And um, if we look into the research programs that are associated to these research clusters, we will also see that in today's um, Day of Light event, we will have representatives that are tackling uh, specific ambitions within these cluster uh, missions. We have Diogo Aguiam speaking about um, something related to key enabling nanotechnologies, photonic structures that are versatile to be used in many different sectors, and he will give an overview about that. We will have um, Beatrice Costa talking about um, ambitions to provide advanced models that can be used in the precise personalized health technologies uh, that allow 3D growth of cellular models and thereby also contribute to precision health tech technology. Then Miguel Xavier will speak about uh, an advanced model that can be used in various applications with a uh, gut on chip model that could be used in food personalizations or control traceability. And then we have uh, Maria João Lopes talking about in a bio-inspired way of harvesting energy using light, which could be seen in the realm of the photovoltaics and clean energy area. So I hope uh, you are excited like me to hear the inspirational talks of our NBTs. Um, Diogo will be the first to speak about microstructures for light manipulation. And there was, I will um, invite uh, Diogo to to um, share his screen with us. Um, uh, Diogo is a staff researcher at INL and uh, with a strong background in nanofabrication. And I'm sure you will see um, a very inspiration talk how nanofabrication, the control of matter on the nano or micro scale can be used in uh, for photonic or optical tools. Diogo, very welcome. Are you gonna hear me? Hello everyone. Thank you. The, the, my talk today is microstructures for light manipulation. I'm a staff researcher at the Integrated Micro Nanotechnologies Group with NSF. So to start, uh, let's go a little bit of the background. So theory of light has been developed since around the sixth or fifth century BC by Indian philosophers. But the first study into geometrical optics to manipulate light is attributed to the Greek Euclid. And the field has evolved greatly since. In geometrical optics, we consider light lights as rays that are bent at the interfaces between two materials. And by machining the curvature of a transparent medium, we can define the focal point where the light rays will concentrate. For very close focal points in large apertures, this would result in very bulky lenses. However, in the 18th century, uh, Augustine Jean Fresnel invented invented a, a new composite a compact lens to be used in lighthouses. This would split the curvature of the, of the original lens into smaller sections with the same curvature, but resulting in a thinner and lighter overall lens. <clears throat> now, imagine if we truncate the lens at much smaller dimensions, so let's say uh, closer to the wavelengths of light. So instead of 
and instead of perfect curvatures, we have, for example, discrete levels. Now we enter into the realm of diffractive optics. At, at this scale, uh, light, uh, light manipulation is mostly governed by diffraction and interference principles. Instead of considering light as composed of rays, we must consider it as the waveframe that locally propagates and interacts through the medium. But it has accentuated diffractive effects, such as higher orders. Now, imagine that we further reduce the size of our features uh, from the micron range we, into the nanometer range, we get into what you've all heard about the, the meta optics and meta lenses. And these, the difference between these is that meta optics use uh, sub wavelength features. So, uh, in this presentation, I hope you get an understanding of the possibilities of using microstructures to manipulate lights. Uh, here you can see one example of a microstructure diffractive lens that has an equivalent face profile of a refractive lens, the bulky ones that we saw earlier. Uh, in this lens, we computed the required topography to achieve the focal length of around 20 millimeters and exposed it into a low contrast photoresist using grayscale direct right, or direct right lithography. Uh, we can see that the topography has a range of around 10 microns, which is, it, it is equivalent to uh, uh, an order of four for the wavelengths of 15, 15 nanometers. Uh, we also, this is the, the resulting lens and we use it to, to, ima to image a, a target in a, with an imaging camera. Um, diffractive optics enable complex optical functions, which are the same as the, which can be the same as the refractive uh, lenses by uh, making the equivalent face profile, but diffractive optics enable much more interesting um, uh, optical functions. But first, it's important to understand how light interacts with matter at the micro scale. So what is diffraction? Diffraction is a phenomenon that arises when a wave encounters a small aperture and results in the bending and interference of light, as we see here. Gratings are the most common diffractive optical elements, which are used to produce spots or to disperse light by the wavelength in spectroscopy. Um, but in practice, since light interacts with all matter at the micro scale, then whatever we see in the world is a result of um, uh, is a result of the interference of the light wave fronts being transmitted or reflected by the micro topography of all objects. So what if we could manipulate light in a way to mimic the interference pattern produced by objects? Uh, we can do it with holograms. Yeah. You have seen holograms like in those shiny panini stickers or the bird that you see in the back of Visa credit cards those are holograms, but holograms are recordings of interference patterns that use diffraction to reproduce a 3D light field. The holographic method was discovered by or developed by Dennis Gaber in the 40s, for which he received the 1971 Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, in the recording of a hologram, an object is illumin illuminated by a coherent light beam, and the reflected light is interferes with the reference beam onto a photographic plate, exposing it. Then in the reconstruction, this plate is illuminated by a, a reconstruction beam, uh, producing an interference pattern that corresponds to the virtual image of the original object for which we see this, this 3D uh, object. Holograms or diffractive optical elements can be used to project any image limited only by the resolution of the plates and the processes of recording. However, how can we design any diffractive optical element without having the original object for it? And to design DOEs, we must first understand how light fields propagate through space uh, using Fourier optics or any other Maxwell theory. So um, how does light propagate? So let's say that we shine a laser through a DOE. How does light propagate so that you get an interference pattern on, on the target? So considering some practical approximations in the near field close to the source or modulating aperture, um, light can be approximated by the Fresnel propagation. Uh, in the far field, uh, the near terms, the near field terms uh, are minimized, and we get the front offer, pro uh, the front offer propagation. One interesting term that comes up in this equation is that the integral part is no longer, there is no more than the Fourier transform of the input light field, making its calculation not only computationally easier, but also giving way to an inverse calculation, which allows us to calculate the DOE pattern that would generate the an expected intensity pattern. So using this inverse calculation, it is possible to estimate the microstructure of this pattern that will generate any intensity that, that we want on the targets. Um, 
And this comes to the iterative Fourier transform algorithm. This algorithm was developed first by Gertzsper and Sexton in 1972, uh, which makes for an algorithm to easily compute the phase that produces the interference pattern of an image. To start, we start with the source intensity and the random initial phase. We calculate the Fourier transform and obtain a certain intensity, which is random because there's no information here. We compare this with, with our target intensity, what you want, we grab the phase, we calculate the inverse Fourier transform and we obtain a certain phase corresponding to this wave. Now, this can be already approximated. We apply some physical constraints of our fabrication processes, our system, our medium, and we iteratively go again, go the, for the Fourier transform and you get the, the new intensity. Now we compare both intensities until we have an error that we are satisfied with. And, and then again, compute inverse Fourier transform and obtain the phase. Now, the output is a 2D phase recording that produces that interference pattern. And this can be binary, multiple resolutions, and so on, and can, or can be continuous phase variation at each pixel. It all depends on how we can then record this phase mask onto a medium. So how do we modulate the phase of the light, the, of the light wave front? We know that if we make that phase modulation, we achieve a certain intensity, but how can we produce this engrave this phase into a physical object. So a phase, a wave in a plane is defined by an amplitude of the phase and the phase, phase changes along the optical path by moving through different mediums or free space and the local surface through the topography of the substrate. So if we consider a trans transmissive medium, light that comes through the bottom here or through the top here will have a different phase shift. So for a transmissive DOE, we can modulate the, the phase by the different um, depths of our surface relief profile and the index of refraction of the medium and of, of the free space. For a reflective DOE, the equation changes slightly. Uh, and here we have the relevant dim dimensions for a green, uh, green laser. So around half a micron or hundred nanometers for transmission and reflective plates. To fabricate these microstructures, now we know. So the most, the most common one uses a mask lithography to expose the photoresist, which is then used to etch the substrate and by removing the photoresist. Now, for a transmissive substrate, we can, with transmissive DOE, we can use directly the etch substrate, or for a reflective one, we can deposit a reflective coating. Uh, what we need is only a variation of the, 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 optical, the optical path of, of our medium. So we don't have actually, we can actually deposit the electric medium on top and make our phase shift using that medium. Um, more complex devices use not only a binary, but multi-level topography to provide high efficiency DOEs as we have here. So as a practical example uh, of a microstructure diffractive optical elements, we computed the phase mask that will produce the INL logo as we have the phase mask here. So as we zoom in, we can see that the phase is not, is not anything that we can make sense of to our human eyes. But if we, as we engrave it onto a substrate and then shine a laser light onto it, we can see that INO logo pattern is projected. Um, so understanding how to manipulate light at the micro uh, and nanoscale opens the opportunity for a number of applications. These were just a few. So in another part that we did here at INL was in the optical MEMS, where combining diffractive gratings onto MEMS devices, like such as a MEMS mirror here, we are able to not only do the beam steering of the MEMS mirror, of the mirror but, use, but actually beam splits the, the incoming light and beam steer it at the same time. Other applications from uh, other groups outside INL were in the biometrics and security, where diffractive micro lenses arrays can be used to further make the imaging systems more compact. Uh, in augmented reality, where the image from a light engine can be coupled into the, the waveguide, the transparent waveguide, and amplified and redirected onto the viewer's eye. Uh, it uh, can be used in diffractive deep neural networks where a uh, trained classifier multi-layer neural network can be recorded onto diffractive plates in order to, to perform complex classification at the speed of light of a neural network that was pre-trained. And in high power laser microstructuring. So one of the ways to increase the throughput of laser microstructuring is to use a very high power rating DOE, such as on a quartz substrate to 
uh, beam split and incoming beam into multiple spots and actually increase the throughput of the laser patterning. So I hope this presentation has piqued your interest in how microstructures can be used for light manipulation and the recent advances in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diogo. Uh, I see there is one question and we'll shortly go back to by Rui Pereira and I will um, I will allow Rui Pereira to, to uh, ask his question directly. Um, hello Rui, if you like, you can now ask a question to Diogo. Maybe the hand was raised by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you mentioned a lot of different applications. Um, which one do you think, uh, yeah, will be the more um, innovative or let's say more um, disruptive technology in in the future? From the um, examples that you showed. Actually, from the example that I show, I think all of them in their individual fields can be quite disruptive. I mean, what we're what is coming up interesting is these capabilities of controlling how we can actually modulate light at the, at the micron level can, can give us control into several applications. So the, actually these examples were kind of interesting and disruptive applications of, of this technology, of mm -hmm. these microstructures. So in, in biometrics and, um, and security systems, this has been going on since the, since the 90s. Mm -hmm. Actually in augmented reality, it's getting a lot of track. Um, for the in, in the past decade decade but most significantly in the past two or three years a lot of people are are, are working on this a lot of companies and private funding um mm -hmm. the, uh, deep neural network uh, diffractive applications this is an interesting concept but uh, i guess you've seen it in, in a lot of fields so artificial intelligence is becoming ubiquitous everywhere and a lot of researchers are investigating how to use the trained networks in a very fast way to get the results so instead of having the computer computing engine the traditional one that we have mm -hmm. uh, do we get in in in, um, in a diffractive with this diffractive plates would be an interesting uh, application thank you very much um due to time i will now ask the second uh, speaker to move on yep. and uh, we will uh, welcome um, beatrice costa uh, she will talk about a project called laser-based 3D microfabrication for cellular studies. And it relates a little bit to the question that just was mentioned in the chat. Uh, the question was whether we have femtosecond lasers at INL. And yes, we have them. And Beatrice was one of them using it <laughs> for microstructuring. Um, Beatrice joined INL already as um, a master's student, but now is a junior researcher, researcher in the project called Diamond for Brain, and um, uh, and also enrolled in a PhD program at the University of Santiago, Vigo, and A Coruña in the area of photonics, uh, light, and vision. So uh, thank you, Beatrice. Feel free to uh, share your screen, and thank you for uh, accepting to present today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um... I'll share my screen now. Okay, I think you can see. Yeah. Um, so yes, I will share with you a little bit of my work focused on uh, laser-based 3D microfabrication for cellular studies. Tissue engineering is a, a vast field that arose to fight several flaws in to transplants, replacement of damaged tissues and generalized therapies. Uh, the appropriate growing microenvironment uh, requires scaffolds, a suitable set of nutrients, um, and also physical chemical stimuli. This work will mainly focus on this part right here, uh, the fabrication of 3D scaffolds and their biocompatibility with cells. Uh, but after all, what, what is a scaffold? Um, a scaffold is no more uh, than a mechanical supporting structure for cells to grow. These structures pretend to mimic the extracellular matrix and allow the growth of cells. 
One widespread design used in 3D scaffolds is called wood pile. It provides complexity, ports to support migration, and large surface areas for cells to grow on. Uh, and this is the first take home message so far. So the main goal here in my project is to create this type of structures to allow the 3D growth of cells and better mimic the biological environment. Uh, and we can actually use light to fabricate these type of structures. Uh, we use in this work two photon polarization, also known as TPP. It's a technique that consists on focusing a laser on a photosensitive material. This occurs in a very confined 3D volume called voxel. Uh, the polymerization only occurs when uh, two simultaneous photons are excited, which makes this a high resolution technique. Uh, further, a wide range of materials can be adapted for TPP, and it can present relatively fast printing times, depending on what guides the laser. Some of the downsizes are the limitation of structure size and the setup cost. Um, in terms of materials that we, we use here, um, the main goal was to check if materials with different mechanical properties were equally suited for the TPP fabrication. The four materials, um, IPDIP, uh, IPS, uh, SZ2080, and PEGDA700, are negative photoresists. And in terms of mechanical properties, the resins are the stiffer materials, and the hydrogel presents the lower model line. Um, for the, the fabrication of wood pile structures, we only use these three materials uh, because the resins are very similar. Designing the wood pile structures uh, implies knowing the size of the cells later used in the culture and taking in consideration that ELA cells have 17 micrometers and mosaicomal stem cells uh, have between 18 and 31 micrometers. Um, these three different designs arose. Uh, so we always kept the pile diameter constant and we varied the pore size between 25, 50 and 100 micrometers. And the main goal here is to see if different dimensions affect the migration of cells. Uh, concerning the fabrication setup, how we actually fabricate these structures, uh, we, we can see the simplified schematic uh, this, the setup uh, main components are a femtosecond pulse laser, an inverted microscope uh, setup. We have an objective to focus the laser, a beam expander to overfill the back aperture of the objective, a camera to oversee the fabrication session, and a custom developed device control software. Uh, concerning some results, uh, the optimization was first performed in terms of writing speed and laser power, and it was assessed that they play a significant role in the structure's stability. So for low exposure conditions, there are visible deformations which result in collapsed structures or asymmetric piling up, sometimes strictly at the center of the structure. Um, and in the end, uh, these five sets of parameters were considered the, the most viable ones for this fabrication. Um, then we move on to, to evaluate the effect of the developer. Um, the developer is the solvent that removes the extra material that we don't want. Um, so using this Novec for IPD reduces the surface tensions and increases the structure stability compared to IPA. So this we can see like major difference when you use IPA versus Novak. Uh, in the end, it's optimized IPS structures precisely followed uh, the design dimensions and show smooth lines. The SZ2080 um, wood pile structures showed dimensions identical to the design ones, except for the edges of the cylinders, and do not present signs of detachment, which is very good for cell interaction studies. The fabrication with PEGDA 700 was uh, more challenging due to the, the lower stiffness. We can see some irregular spots, uh, but nonetheless, it was feasible, and we obtained this, uh, these final structures. Uh, the following step involves some properties of these structures. We started with mechanical properties. Uh, this is an assay to assess how stiff uh, the materials are, 
you fabricate these square structures here um, and they are immersed in water. Uh, then this tip, we can see in the video, uh, this tip um, can reach the surface and we then obtain this type of curve. And when we analyze these results, we observed that there was a heterogeneous behavior of stiffness. So interestingly, two different stiffness regions could be distinguished between the inner core and the outer core, which may be associated with the water solvent, or it can also be associated with the, the laser um, and the parameters that we use during fabrication. A closer look shows that inside the structures we have uh, values in the few megapascal range, and the exterior we have few hundreds of kilopascal. And these findings provide novel opportunities for cell interface interaction studies, preserving the same material while we can modify uh, the material stiffness. So this is, is very important for future studies when we know that that material is compatible, but we would like to tune their mechanical properties. We also studied the fluorescence properties. Uh, materials with the excessive fluorescence compromise live cell imaging. Therefore, we try to minimize this increasing characteristic. In our study, we tried to quench the fluorescence with UV treatments. When we look into these pictures and graphs, we can see that UV lamp was able to decrease the fluorescence in 70%, but UV confocal was the most efficient one. Previous studies reported uh, decreases around 50% with chemical treatments, and we could achieve almost 90%, so a significant improvement in decreasing this fluorescence. Uh, moving on to the cell assays. Um, this first picture here is scanning uh, electron microscopy with fixed cells, and the other two are confocal microscope images. And in confocal microscopy, um, it's very important to, to say, for those who are not aware, uh, we can stay in just different cell components or different um, uh, activities of the cells or proteins, or we can uh, stay in a lot of different components. And the most important aspect is not to overlap the different emission spectra. Uh, in this case, we stain with green, the live cells, and with pink, the dead cells. Um, and overall, there were no big difference between the three materials for hosting the cells. Uh, we found that fibronectin functionalization, which is this extracellular matrix glycoprotein, really improves uh, the interaction quality. And when we look into the cell's morphology, we can see very elongated shapes uh, along either individual polymer structures or even spanning up to 50 microns to reach different scaffold elements, which indicates very high affinity for these materials. When we compare the different sizes, the 100 micron gap scaffolds present the most promising results. Uh, and we found higher homing rates than the smaller 50 and 25 microns gap. The scaffolds with 25 microns, this one here, anchored the migration of bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells um, to the scaffold core, probably because the cells are too big to migrate into these smaller uh, bars. Uh, for six days, uh, dead cells were not found in the scaffolds treated with fibronectin, which indicates viability of 100%. Uh, there are clear tendency of proliferation increase over time. And the scaffold with 100 microns gap represents again the higher number of viable cells. And these are the, the take home messages. So laser-based techniques, including TPP, allow the fabrication of 3D structures with different materials. We can reduce the out of fluorescence of materials with focused UV illumination. And finally, cell culture assays with fluorescence imaging um, enable study several cell activities. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'm looking forward to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Um, yeah, if there are questions, please write them on the Q&A or raise your hand. I can also provide you um, short speaking time for one or two questions. OK, 
Okay. I don't see a new question on the Q and A for the moment. Yes, you can simply ask your questions in the Q and A um, button on the bottom. Um, Beatrice, you, you showed now uh, cells interacting with 3D polymers and also hydrogels. Um, do you notice any advantages of one or the other, or what was the reason to, to study so many different materials? So the, the main reason here is we try to, to mimic as much as possible um, the biological conditions. And in different regions of our body, we have this different uh, stiffness. So for instance, the bone, it's very rigid. Uh, while we have these softer tissues, uh, well, where the stiffness is, is lower. So it's, it's very important to have here a, a wide range of stiffness um, to, to different parts of our body. That's the main reason. Okay, I see one other question here in the in the chat from from Mariana. I think she she could ask herself directly. She has uh, she can part of the panel. So if you want to <laughs> unmute <laughs> your <laughs> microphone. <laughs> so I was just wondering, and I find it quite interesting as we're talking about nanostructures. Uh, how small can you get? and size within these structures. Can you go all the way to nanometers dimensions or um, only on micrometer size? For now, I'm working on micro uh, range, uh, but it actually depends on the objective. Um, so I'm using a 40X objective, uh, which allows me to have this micrometer, uh, one micrometer voxel, give it or take. Uh, probably if you go to, to higher, um, objectives we could go to to smaller sizes well you will not cross the optical diffraction limit just by exchanging the microscope objective but of course there are ways to uh, for example use super resolution strategies to deplete a part of the polymer and only activate uh, the center and i think um, structures around 50 nanometers were reported a slightly larger features compared to the imaging analog where um, you don't have basically polymer cross-chain reactions that typically enlarge the, the active voxel a little bit. So in, in the records of small feature sizes, um, the TPP, the two-photon polymerization pattern is slightly larger than what is um, being achieved in super-resolution microscopy, but indeed reaching the tens of nanometer scale. Okay, with this, um, I think, uh, yeah, I'm happy to thank uh, Beatrice again for her great presentation. Thank you. And thank you. with this, I would like to invite um, the, the next speaker um, to present. And this is uh, Miguel Chavier. Miguel is um, uh, Marie Curie uh, postdoctoral fellow at INL, who will talk today about a project called Get on Ship Models and advanced light techniques. Or well, let's say the project is not called like this, but he, he was so kind to make a creative title for our day of light um, uh, celebration, uh, including upon my request light and the title. So I'm very curious what you're going to talk about and um, yeah, how to see also this interdisciplinary dimension in your work. So Miguel, the stage is yours. Please feel free to share your screen with us. Hi, everyone. So can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, and can you hear me well? Yes. Great, fantastic. So yeah, uh, that's true. I was kind of uh, convinced to include light in the name of my talk. And um, I must say, I was also surprised by the invitation. I was like, uh, Miguel, do you want to talk about your work and how you use light um, on a daily basis on your work? And I was like, do I? Do I use light on my work? <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I thought, and yeah, well, I guess I do a little bit, but I have to be quite creative to, to come up with it. <laughs> so let's hope it goes well. So the work is actually about um, gut on a chip, and why would we uh, want to simulate a gut on a chip or, on, or, or in a micro device, let's say, 
This is because when we are developing a new drug or a new food, we want to be able to test uh, what's the bioaccessibility or the bioavailability of this drug and food. So basically, we want to know what is the fraction of what we eat that actually, uh, let's say, survives the process of digestion, which is quite a complex uh, process. And then from that uh, fraction, uh, how much of it is actually absorbed um, in the gut. Now, you might have heard of uh, cell culture and you might have heard of transo assays. This is basically a membrane-based assay where you culture cells uh, on top of this membrane and then you can add your compounds to one of the sides of the membrane and um, check how much crosses to the other side. So this is an in vitro technique, it's quite a simple model. And then you might also have heard of animal models um, like mice. Uh, now, the gut chip or the organ on chip in general, for me, sits somewhere in between these in vitro and these in vivo models. So it's, it offers more complexity, it offers more physiological relevance than the in vitro models. But of course, it's, it will never be as complex as, as an animal, as in vivo models, but it gives you also advantages over this um, in the sense that you are able to use human cells. So you can use human cells in organ on chip and thus you can circumvent the problems that are associated with interspecies variability. So I think it's um, a really nice technology to work with. Uh, of course, when you work with gut on chip, it, it's not all just using um, human cells, because you could, you could also use human cells in those in vitro simplified models. Uh, what I'm going to try to convince you as well is that size matters. So in these devices, usually you work with smaller sizes. And you can see here a large range of sizes. On the right hand side, you've got one meter, which is about the size of a person. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, you get an atom, which is about one angstrom. And then usually I do this in an interactive way where I ask people, so what's about this size? And they will tell me. Uh, in this setting, it's a little bit complicated, so I'll, so I'll just do it myself, so, so bear with me. So if you go to, to the left-hand side, in about one nanometer range, you get like nucleic acids, like DNA and RNA. Then if you go to the other side, you get like a, a mosquito will be about one centimeter. And then again, um, uh, to the smaller end of this spectrum, you get proteins about 10 nanometers. Um, about one millimeter, you have loads of stuff, but I just picked a tick. I was once bitten by a tick and I was really annoyed. Uh, it took me a while to find it because, as you see, it's quite small. Uh, but going again to the smaller end of this, viruses, we hear about them all the time. And actually, coronaviruses, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but please correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, I think they are about 200 nanometers in size. Um, and then more interesting stuff in terms of biology, you've got bacteria in around one micron, animal cells around 10 microns, but you actually have uh, much bigger animal cells, you can get uh, cells uh, actually being almost one meter long. Some of, our, some, some of the neurons in our body are about one meter long, believe it or not. And then if, I chose a hair for 100 microns because actually a hair is about the limit of what our eyes can discern. So we are able to tell apart two objects that are 100 micrometers apart, but smaller than that, you start needing something to help you, some kind of magnification like a microscope. Now. In devices, of course, we don't work in 1D, we work in 3D, so uh, we need to think about volumes and not just lengths. And when we think about volumes, <clears throat> usually in terms of fluids, we know that one cubic meter is about a thousand liters. We are kind of familiar with these kind of volumes, but what I wanted to convey is how quickly this actually falls, how quickly the volume reduces when we reduce uh, the size scale. So if you've got one cubic millimeter, that's already one microliter. And this goes down really fast, right? It goes down, uh, goes down with, the, with the power of three. So then you get one nanoliter, one picoliter, one femtoliter, and so on and so forth. And this is important because in microfluidics or in organ on shape, we typically work within the scale of one micron in terms of the channel size to one microliter in terms of the volume. So this is about the ranges of scales that we work with. And in this scale, um, some interesting stuff happens. So you will know that, for example, diffusion, um, if there is no convection at all, takes ages. So it takes actually 12 minutes for one atom of sodium to diffuse uh, one millimeter through. But if you want to diffuse it through just one micrometer, this takes less than one millisecond. Um, in terms of eating up stuff, if you want to do a PCR and eat very quickly uh, through your, your PCR cycles, um, if you want to do it over one millimeter, in terms of um, thermal diffusion, it will take you seven seconds. But if you want to do it over one micrometer, it takes seven microseconds. So at a micro scale, you can also heat up uh, and cool down as well stuff a lot quicker. If you want to generate an electric field and uh, one kilovolt per meter electric field just 
for by curiosity is a biotelectric field and you, you know you need, for example, to run electrophoresis. Um, if you've got a one millimeter um, distance, you need one volt. If you've got a one micrometer, you need one millivolt. So you can work with um, much uh, lower voltages, which is also an advantage. Now, another thing that happens at the micro scale is what we call laminar flow. So the, the way that fluids behave um, in the macro scale, which is the scale that we are used to see or, or we are usually exposed to, is called turbulent flow. So turbulent flow is pretty much the opposite of laminar flow. And in turbulent flow, what happens is that inertia dominates over viscosity. So if you're having your morning coffee and if you're turning the coffee around your mug, if you stop turning your spoon, actually the liquid continues going around the mug, right, for a while. So this is inertia dominating the system. It, it also happens if you go for a swim. Just, I just went for a swim this morning and just, well, just really to see if this was true or not. So if, if you're swimming down the lane and then if you stop swimming, your body will continue for a few meters before it actually, it actually stops. However, at the, the micro scale, this is not true. So at the micro scale, inertia starts dominating over viscosity. So if bacteria are swimming uh, in the swimming pool and if they stop moving their flagelli, they will stop pretty much immediately. That's because at, um, at the micro scale, viscosity dominates over inertia. This is determined by an dimensional number, which is called the Reynolds number. And basically this is the equation. It comes with the fluid density, the flow velocity, the dimensions of the channel and the viscosity. For water, which is typically the type of fluids that we work in biology, the values are there on the screen. And if you do a simple calculation, you can, say, you can see that the Reynolds number will be around one. And you can, as you see on the left-hand side, if it's lower than 2000, then it's laminar flow. It's, if it's bigger than that, it starts getting into the turbulent regime. So one is definitely in the laminar flow regime. Um, this gives us strange properties. So you will be flowing uh, liquids in the microchannel. This is a microchannel and they will flow side by side uh, without mixing because the flow is laminar. So there is no turbulence in the, in the, um, in the system. So they will just flow side by side without ever mixing. Uh, or well, they will eventually mix because of diffusion but they will not mix as you would expect when two flows come in together. At the macro scale, this happens, for example, when two glaciers are flowing. So here, of course, is because the viscosity of the, the flow of the glaciers is really, really large. So it's not because the scale is small. We are changing uh, one other of the terms of that equation, which is viscosity. And you can see that they, they can flow parallelly without mixing as well. Now, what I want to show you by this video, this again is at the macro scale, as you can see, these are the hands of a person, one of my colleagues from Southampton. You have probably seen uh, a device similar to this one uh, on my desk, on top of my desk, where, where I usually sit here at INL, uh, if you work at INL. Um, and what Dan is doing here is that he is injecting drops of three fluids that are, well, this is just food color, and this food color is diluted in corn syrup. And this device is basically two concentric cylinders. So there is one cylinder in the center that turns around itself. And then there's another outer cylinder and there's a spacing between the two. And uh, we filled it up with corn syrup, which is extremely viscous. So again, we are at the macro scale, but we are using a very viscous solution. And what happens is you have these three um, food dyes there also in corn syrup. As you start turning the inner circle or the inner cylinder, sorry, you are creating flow by drag, right? So there is a shear stress that is dragging the fluid around. And as you can see, as it goes around, those three food colors start mixing. Now, eventually, if you start turning in the other direction, that's what Dan is doing right now, is turning in the opposite direction. And I, I can promise you, we didn't just reverse the video, okay? This is actually filmed just in one go. Uh, what happens is that the, actually the flow is going to go in the other way, and follow the exact same path because this is laminar flow. Actually here, uh, it's called Stokes flow, which is um, in a very, very uh, extreme of the, the laminar flow with very low Reynolds number. So what this shows you is that flow at the laminar scale is actually deterministic and is reversible. So it gives us a lot of control over what we do. Now, fabricating a gut on chip device, uh, Beatriz already alluded uh, to photoresists and how to use light um, to polymerize photoresists. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that again. So we need molds to fabricate our devices. We usually, usually we start with a silicon wafer and we add um, a photoresist, we deposit a photoresist on top of this wafer, then we spin coat it and uh, spin coating is basically what you see here in this video. Uh, what you see here is not actually a photoresist, it's PDMS, but it behaves very much in the same way. 
as you spin code, um, basically you start spreading, um, in this case, the PDMS or the photoresist and the speed and the length or the time that you do the spin coating for is going to determine the thickness that you have of your photoresist. And the thickness is going to be at the end, the height of your structures, okay? Then you're going to expose uh, your photoresist to light, typically UV light, and you do it through a photo mask. So basically you only are going to expose the features that you're going to want to stay um, in your molds if you're working with a negative photoresist, as Beatrice uh, told you, or you're going to expose everything else if you're working with a positive photoresist. So a negative photoresist is going to harden when it's exposed to the, to the light. The positive photoresist is going to become soluble when it's exposed to the light. And that's why you have to work with yellow light in the clean room. So this is basically to filter out all the wavelengths that you don't want to expose your features to while you are working with your wafer. So you only want the light to, to be exposed to your wafer in a controlled manner and through a photo mask and not just in all the clean room. And that's why we need to use and work uh, under yellow light. Then you develop and you get your features, as you can see in this finalized wafer of one of our devices uh, in a very controlled manner. Finally, and that was PDMS that I showed you before. So usually you use a, an elastomer um, that you're going to pour over your mold. You bake it in the oven just as you're doing a cake. And then you get uh, your <clears throat> parts of the device. And you can see here on the right-hand side, one part of the device. We also fabricate membranes. Uh, this is where we culture our cells on top. And then if you have uh, the bottom part with a membrane in between and the top part, you get this um, device. This is a 3D representation of one of our devices. Um, other ways that we can use light for fabricating gut on shape devices is by cutting um, polymers using lasers. And we do this, we call this uh, laser cutting. And in this way, what we do is we, co we cut uh, polymethyl metacrylate sheets. Um, we cut several sheets of them, and then we basically use this kind of layer by layer approach of assembling them together to making devices. So this is not a gut on shape, this, this is one of our digestion shapes. And just to show you how it works, it's really, really convenient. So I just went in this morning. Um, I typed INL on the computer and I, and I got it to raster this INL for you guys to see uh, how it works really nicely. And then I forgot to stop the video, so I'm going to go. <laughs> this is the final result. So you've got your device. Um, this is flow going through the top channel. Um, and then I'm going to show you how we fill. Actually, it was the bottom channel first. Now we were filling the, the top channel with another die. And you can see that they don't mix because there is a membrane in between separating the two channels. So it works really well. Now, then, as I was telling you, we seed cells on top of these membranes. We grow cells to grow an epithelium so that we can actually test our stuff. How do we see cells on, in a gut on shape? And usually when we talk about light, we only think about visible light, right? That's what we think about. There's light coming from the sun and we can see stuff and it's visible light. But you probably heard about the electromagnetic spectrum. It actually covers a whole, um, well, spectrum I'm sorry for the redundancy of wavelengths and frequencies, and you can have gamma rays to microwaves, but usually we work on the, on the visible range or let's say for fluorescence, which is what I'm going to talk about next, we go through a little bit of ultraviolet to visible to infrared. So within this range, uh, what happens is that there's an array or there's a range of molecules that we can use, that we can shed light on them. They're going to get, come to an excited state. There's some kind of internal conversion but then what's, what happens is that this excited state is going to go back to ground state and it emits um, fluorescence. Um, and what happens is that always the absorption of, of these molecules is going to be at a shorter wavelength uh, than the emission. And this is called the Stokes shift. Well, this is very useful for biology because there's um, so many fluorophores and then you can use antibodies to actually stain our cells in very specific manner. So we use this in our devices. So these are actually cells growing in our membranes. We have stained the nuclei of the cells, as you can see in the, in the left hand, on the left-hand side. Um, we have stained oclodin, which is a protein that uh, basically uh, cells will express and form junctions between them that's going to limit diffusion through cells. We have stained the cytoskeleton and then it, uh, with actin. And also, you can also see uh, the merge of all them. And then you can see that after some days, these cells grow and they will cover the whole membrane. Just to show you how you can get really beautiful images. So this was done by confocal microscopy here at INL. Um, so we basically took several images uh, at different planes, and then we make this reconstruction where you can see we are going from the top of the, the membranes to uh, the bottom of the membrane. And you can see there's actually these kind of three-dimensional structures that the cells form that resembles quite nicely what happens uh, in the gut. 
And this is just showing you um, a projection of the whole uh, images. And just to show you that you can also then use this for functional assays. Uh, so what we did here was you have the same standing as before, and then we actually challenged the epithelium with EDTA. So calcium chelator is going to disrupt the tie junction. So you can see the staining of Ocovin actually goes down, um, as you can see here better. And then we added a fluorescent molecule as a reporting molecule, which is called Lucifer Yellow, to one of the channels and checked how much flow uh, flowed through the membrane to the other channel. And you can see that you can actually detect pretty nicely that in the disrupted epithelium, we have a lot more permeability than in the normal epithelium. And just to finish, I wanted to show you another application of uh, fluorescence and what it can do, and also uh, touching on the nano part of things. So this is a project that um, I work with in collaboration with I3S. We also do microfluidic devices for them. And what they do here is that we have these microfluidic devices with two chambers, and they have these really small uh, 10 micrometer wide microchannels connecting these chambers. And then you have neurons growing, in this case, on the left hand side, so on the, on, on the left chamber, that are extending their neurites to, to the right chamber. But then uh, we are actually adding nanoparticles to the right uh, chamber, and we want to check if these neurons are able to transport them to their um, bodies on the left hand side. And as you can see, the nanoparticles here are marked with CY5 um, for the DNA. So they are in red. And if you look on, on the image on the, on the right-hand side, you can see the particles here. They have been transported to the neurons on this side. So these nanoparticles are indeed being transported by the neurons, which is really nice to see. And that's all. So I hope that I could creatively show you how I uh, use a little bit of light in my work. Uh, just finishing to thank um, people who have worked in this uh, project, actually, um, well, these people are a lot more active in the lab nowadays than I am, or at least some of them are. Maybe not Lorenzo Pastrana is not very active in the lab, but uh, all other people are. And of course, all the group and some of the names of people that have worked in the project in the past as well. And thank you for your attention. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you very, very much, Miguel. I think it's very clear you work with light, <laughs> impressive images, very beautiful, confocal images, I think, and um, very interesting. Um, study that I didn't know about uh, now the, the new uh, neuronal studies and the transport of, of nanoparticles. Um, very, very interesting. I'm sure there will be questions coming up. At the moment, I don't uh, see yet any. So I'm actually curious to, to learn more about this. Like, what, what is the hypothesis of this motion of these nanoparticles along these, um, yeah, flagella? Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't go into details because I, I knew I was running out of time. But uh, yes. the idea, or actually, these nanoparticles are functionalized with a fragment of the tetanus toxin. And uh, tetanus toxin, the way it works, is that it's actually rich. Well, it's it's kind of a, a Trojan horse approach because the tetanus toxin will be retrogradely transported uh, by neurons to the the central nervous system. So this is a way. Um, that we are trying to, to make uh, for drug or gene delivery to the central nervous system. So we would be able to inject these nanoparticles, for example, in the muscle and peripheral neurons, uh, if this works, because the particles are uh, modified with this fragment of the tetanus toxin, will then transport them to the, the axon bodies. And then the cortical neurons will transport them to the central nervous system. So that's the hypothesis uh, behind this work. Very interesting. Are there any other questions, either from the audience or from the panelists? I can also answer questions at the end if they come up. Yes, yes, yes. And I just, also I just remind that that there will be, of course, the, the quiz. So some questions were formulated by the speakers with some multiple choice. Uh, you will see three wrong answers and the, you have to select the correct one. So yeah, we will be curious about the scoring there. Mariana, you have a question. Yeah, I was just commenting that in the beginning, he was saying that he struggled a lot, saying how he used light in his, in his work. But in the end, he uses light all the time because most of these microfluidic devices uh, use light to be made. Although you don't use them as a, a final result, it is part of the research. So uh, sometimes, uh, so it's just a, a comment that sometimes we take light for granted. 
so we don't really realize that we are actually using because it's so normal that like we are looking at something and it's visible so that we take for granted <laughs> yes okay if there's no other question then i will uh, invite our uh, speaker um, maria joan lopez to present her work she will give an inspirational talk about her project which is part of her phd uh, project in the frame of the quantum portugal initiative and um, besides this inspirational talk she will also talk a little bit about one of the techniques that will be important for her studies um, the streak imaging technique and yeah we are very much happy that uh, maria joan accepted to to give her presentation and um you're free now to to share your screen with us hello everyone <laughs> so let's share, let me share my screen Can you see it already? Yes. Okay. So, hello everyone again. So first of all, Yana, thank you for the introduction and also the invitation. Uh, my name is Maria Joel and I'm a PhD student of the Ultrafast Bio and Nanophotonics Research Group. Uh, as you can see on the screen, my, my topic is about light and energy harvesting. Uh, in my PhD project, we are developing synthetic, uh, synthetic constructs to harvest light energy and study the presence of quantum coherent energy transfer in circuits based on molecular aggregates. So today I'm going to do an overview of the photosynthesis process as an inspiration to develop the synthetic uh, harvesting circuits. Then I will briefly present two, two distinct uh, models of energy transfer used to explain these type of systems. Uh, I will present our approach to mimic the natural harvest systems. And finally, I will explain the use of the street camera as a tool to characterize these systems and the information we can get from it. So a 3 billion years uh, refined process known as photosynthesis occurs in nature uh, where plants, algae and certain bacteria absorbs radiant energy from the sun, um, transport, and, transport and convert it into biochemical energy essential for their growth. Uh, natural harvesting systems, especially organized densely packed chromophore aggregates, using protein scaffolds to achieve this highly efficient and directed tra uh, energy transfer. Despite the greatly complicated structure of the photosynthetic machinery in various uh, light harvesting systems, such as the purple bacteria, uh, they are known to harvest and deliver the excitation uh, energy to the photochemical uh, reaction centers with remarkable efficiency almost with, with no energy losses, uh, losses throughout the entire energy transfer and, and, and energy conversion processes. But how can they do it in such elegant and almost perfect manner? It has been proven that one of these strategies is the presence of quantum coherence to direct energy flow from molecule to molecule through the protein scaffolds. So a collective coherent state between a photon and the antenna pigment generates a coherent energy transfer. In opposition to the classical theory, after the absorption of a photon, the energy transfer, uh, transfer from the antenna pig pigment to the reaction center is described uh, by the incoherent hopping. So this ultra efficient process has been an inspiration to attempt it, attempting to unravel its mechanisms. So it is possible to mimic these natural systems uh, using strongly coupled multi-chromophore dyes into molecular scaffolds. And certain dyes such as the cyanine dyes have optimal photophysical properties and have the ability to self-assemble on double-stranded DNA duplexes, forming DNA templated aggregates similar to J or H aggregates in terms of their molecular packaging, spectroscopy, and energy transfer properties. 
these hybrids will result in very different uh, prop uh, properties, such as the flu uh, fluorescence lifetime and spectral shapes. Uh, here, uh, a robust DNA templated hybrid system is being tested um, using different types of cyanide dyes, and the full uh, photophysical properties are being tested. As an outcome, we'll have a DNA dye hybrid wire where the DNA cyanine aggregates will, uh, will be used as a molecular bridge to construct different types of long range with donor, bridge, uh, and acceptor energy transfer systems. One of the techniques used for their characterization is the street camera. Uh, I'm going to present as an example the results obtained from the streak for a quinoline based uh, cyanine free in solution, uh, in buffer solution, and also self assembled to DNA with only adenines and timines, known as uh, AT track, uh, with 30 base pairs. So the street camera is an ultra high speed detector which captures light emission uh, phenomena occurring in picosecond periods, so in extremely short uh, periods. Uh, in addition to this temporal uh, resolution, the street camera can capture spectral data uh, simultaneously. Uh, the setup includes an excitation laser. Here at INL, we have available uh, the femtosecond lasers for 379 nanometers, uh, 467 nanometers, and 561 nanometer, nanometers. Um, a sample holder. For my study, we are using a cuvette based sample compartment and a ultra micro cuvette for uh, 45 microliters of volume. Uh, it also includes a um, spectrograph, a time delay unit. Um, a street, the street camera detector and uh, an Orca R2 CCD camera. Usually, uh, the lifetime instruments using a street camera as a detector provide a better resolution than those on the single, single photo, uh, photon timing technique. So here we have the results obtained for peak free solution without DNA as a scaffold. And this dye doesn't present any fluorescence under these uh, conditions. The quantum hill uh, of, the, um, of fluorescence for free peaking aqueous buffer solution uh, without DNA is extremely low at room, at room, temperature, uh, at room temperature. This can be explained by uh, efficient non-radiative uh, non deactivation process due to the free rotation of these two quinolinic rings of peak molecules. The, rest the restriction of rotation upon, upon binding the peak to the DNA results in an, res results in a significant increase of the fluorescence yield and also uh, the predicted J aggregates formed in uh, AT tracts are responsible, uh, responsible for this increase in, in flu flu fluorescence. In this slide, uh, I present a typical image obtained through the street camera, where it is possible to observe the fluorescence intensity of peak dye assembled to DNA AT track with 30 base pairs as a function of time and uh, wavelength uh, variations. Through this image, we are able to extract information about the fluorescence spectrum and the respective uh, uh, fluorescence lifetime decays and calculate the estimated uh, fluorescence lifetime for the sample using an uh, exponential uh, decay model. So with this, uh, I got the end, the, we got the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Um... You, you showed now one example of a street camera with a single dye emitting. Uh, can you comment a little bit what would happen if you would have an acceptor donor par and um, what you would, yeah, yeah, how the street camera could help you, yeah, gain knowledge about such system? Yeah, if the idea is to have the, the full the wire with the acceptor and, and the, the, the first with the donor the bridge uh, to relay the energy from the, the primary donor and the acceptor. I'm, uh, 
with with the street camera, I'll be able to see the the life the the emitted fluorescence from uh, from the three parts of the of the wire, and I'm hopefully I will get only the fluorescence uh, of the acceptor because the idea is to transmit the energy uh, from the primary donor through the bridge and finally uh, mm -hmm. the acceptor. So it, it will be very uh, useful to use this technique to prove that the we are having this energy mm -hmm. transfer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there questions in the audience concerning either the streak technique or this approach using strongly coupled molecule for excitation energy transfer and mimicking excitation energy transfer processes in nature? If not, we we will continue with um, uh, a short overview of, of um, how to join INL and then how to access our facilities. And Mariana will, will talk about that. Uh, this is for both for external users that would be interested in using microscopes as well as internals. And um, yeah, so, so to this, how to join INL, I will uh, mention the different paths. Of course, there's a very obvious one, which is you just look for the career opportunities, the vacancies that we have at the moment. And if you see that your profile is matching any of them, you will see the category of the type of um, position mentioned, as well as um, the contact person and the, and the job offer. It is important that all applications are, of course, transmitted through the official platform. So uh, it does not help that you send your application material as a whole to, to the INLS only, but you need to, to really go through the system. But then there are, of course, other uh, ways to, to become an INLR, for example, as an associate. And as an associate, that can be either that you are a researcher in a different institution or at the university, or that you are a, studi a student or that you are um, working at a company and you would like to perform a traineeship uh, that is supported by the employer. So if we look a little bit into what is behind uh, these different options, you can see that, of course, in the career portal, you will see the, the overview of the opened positions. There are staff researcher positions, some with and without um, kind of indefinite contract procedures. So ask the, um, ask the contact person, what are the conditions of this, uh, of this position? Then you have research fellow um, positions, which are typically um, one to four year positions, depending on the project that, that is uh, offered. You will have this on senior level, but also on junior fellow level. Uh, this means that you are possibly working and being hired to work in a project while in parallel, you might be allowed to, to do a PhD. We have uh, as a junior fellow here, as example, Beatrice, as the panelist who, who works in a project but was able to, to apply to become uh, yeah, also a PhD, uh, PhD student at a university. There are research engineers. Um, most of the engineers that I and I work related to the clean room, but there are also other opportunities. So please keep your eyes open. Um, we have technology engineering groups that are assisting the research groups in, in some of the more engineering tasks that are also having regularly openings. Um, then, of course, there are also non-scientific jobs at INL that relate to either administration, the legal department, project management, site management, or communication. So you, can, you understand probably that, uh, yeah, the, the research we do is also based on, on a lot of support systems that, that facilitate um, the, the work we do. Um, and another way to enter INL as an employee is, of course, to come with your own fellowship. If this is supported um, by INL, there's a very competitive grant that if you get, uh, you might be able to get, yeah, in, in letter of support to apply, for example, the schemes of the ESC grants or Marie Curie fellowships are such examples. So uh, please contact then um, a research group leader or researcher in your area, or simply the research office if you apply on a very senior level. Um, yeah, I think um, that is the, the, the options about the employees. 
But then I mentioned already as an interesting opportunity if you are enrolled in a university or if you are working in a company and your company wants you to conduct research that is aligned with what we do that could be done in a corporation or um, through an access to the facility, there are different schemes and um, such as I mentioned already, an um, internship could be for a master research um, stay that you decide to conduct your master research at the INL lab. So in this case, you would look for a research group that works in a topic that is of interest to your um, master program. Um, at INL, we work in a very broad um, uh, palette of, of research, right, that it could fit either a master in biology or bioengineering and physics engineering and life science, uh, material engineering and so on. So um, if you have any doubts, um, please uh, try, to, try to find out one of the research group leaders that may fit the topic of your interest best. And I'm sure they will be able to help you identify if there is a place for you to, to apply. Um, I mentioned project associates. Um, uh, that if there is R&D supported by your host organization to, to join INL this way. And of course, for senior members or professors that, that would like to um, conduct a um, sabbatical or that would uh, like to enter a long-term engagement with INL, there, if it is strategically aligned, uh, please also contact the INL research office and you might get some feedback if it's possible to work as an associate with us. And with this, um, of course, uh, you don't need to be an associate to use some of our facilities. And with this, I, I will then invite Mariana to describe our process, uh, the facilities that are related to light. So in this case, nanophotonics and bioimaging open access research core facilities. And um, you will learn not only about the techniques that we have, but also about some of the highlights that were published in the last years and maybe you work in a similar field and, and get inspired and yeah feel free to ask any questions how to use our equipment get the training and uh, yeah what are the conditions of gaining access to them thank you mariana for accepting this invitation um, you can then share your presentation with us I hope you now see my screen. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. So thank you, Jana. So you heard a lot about uh, about our researchers uh, doing different types of studies using light within INL. Uh, first of all, I'm. I'm I want to apologize because I'm a little bit, uh, my voice is not that good today, but that's okay. So, but when we think first of INL, I th we think nanostructures and, and uh, nanofabrication. We don't need, like, it's, it's hard to think uh, of bioimaging or either nanophotonics and in a, such a, in the central laboratory, but that's not true. We do a lot of light applications in here. And, and that's what I want to show you. So some of you might know, INL is an international institute also made uh, by about 10 years ago by a consortium between Spain and, and Portugal. And we have a couple of open facilities. So at the moment, we have four open facilities that anyone can access just requesting access through our website. Everything we do is ISO certificated. So we have a whole process regarding every, all, all, the, all the work that we're doing here. Uh, we don't do work only for RNLers or for researchers that are in cooperative uh, works with someone in here. But for instance, uh, if someone from the industry wants to come or someone, someone in the 
in the university wants to come, they are very welcome to join, to ask for requests and ask them, call us and see if we can help you in any, any way. Regarding the nanophotonics and bio and bioimaging facility, uh, it's run by Yana that you already met, and I'm the facility manager. So I, my main job is taking care of the instruments that are here at INL to serve you. We do both, uh, like the nanophotonics and, and bioimaging facility, can we can provide you work in many different areas and not only with the instruments that are listed in in our website but we can also find solutions for your problems so if you have a toxicology problem or drug delivery or uh, or something like that we can try to find uh, find a solution for your for your issue not just in biological samples but also in material samples so we do a lot of spectroscopy. So these are some examples of the instruments that we have available uh, a Fourier transform infrared uh, spectrometer, for example, ellipsometers, which are not so uh, people are not so used to, to see and to hear about it, but they are very useful for those who make um, thin films or uh, st structures for solar cells, for example, material sciences, uh, and also spectrometers and anything that do fluorescence at also. Uh, we also have solutions for imaging. So you've seen some images from the Confoco. Uh, for instance, at this time, we didn't show any, any work on the, on the turf and super resolution, but we have the capability of doing it. And we also do specialized work, as, as the case of the microfabrication system that uh, Beatrice showed you, and also combining different techniques. And for example, in this differential spinning disk of fluorescence microscopy with AFM, uh, which last year uh, Peter who developed this technique here at INL uh, showed in the AUDOX uh, meeting. You can see uh, a little bit of the, the talk in the link that I show in the bottom of the screen. So in the end, they have a atomic force microscope that uses light to measure the atomic force between uh, a tip and your sample. It can be either material samples or biological samples. In this case, it's a cell, they are, they are cell samples. Uh, in together with the, with the fluorescence microscope and they can correlate the two images. And you can also study different applications and there are a lot of different things you can do with that. Uh, we are also growing. We just, if you, if you were with us last year, you saw me presenting a live experiment using the, this new 3D cell explorer holotomograph microscope, which creates images based on holotomogra holo holotomo holo holotomography. So they are based on the difference between the refractive index, so between the media and the cells. So we can follow up cell growth or uh, keep on cells uh, looking at how the cells behave in a medium for very long periods of time without uh, without really needing to put anything extra to the cell growth media as a, as a fluorophore or anything like that. Uh, our newest uh, equipment is a nanosite, which is sort of a nano tracker that measures both uh, concentration of particles between 5, 50 and 30 nanometers, for example, and also the size of the particles 
and it also has some fluorescence uh, capabilities as well. So just to give you an example of different applications of people using our instruments, uh, in this case, I'm showing uh, research made by INLers. So you can find the, the, the DOI to the full paper in the, in the slide. So in this case, they are using a microfluidic chip, which is the Ruby chip, it's called the Ruby chip, that's capable of separating uh, cancer cells that they are losing the blood flow, for example, and they stain it and they can make, and they can observe it and study it. And they, they make, they can make, uh, how can I say, uh, diagnosis quite fast using this this sort of chip. Uh, the the Ruby chip is was developed at INL, but is also part of a, a, a startup company that started here at INL as well. So it's quite interesting, and they are using uh, our, one of our inverted fluorescence microscopes to do most of the imaging. Okay, not only micros microscopy, but HAMA. So HAMA is also a spectroscopy technique, but we can do imaging as well. So we use, we have a confocal Raman micro microscope that can do, that collect the Raman spectra for many, many different points in, in your sample and create images based on the on peaks of different materials. So for example, you have uh, a sample that in this case is a photo for photo detectors with graphene and they can see if they are uniformly distributed using the using the different uh, peaks in the Raman spectrum to create different images. And for an spectroscopy example, in the in the Fourier transform, in the Fourier transform, uh, <coughs> sorry, infrared spectros spectrometer, we can do from powders to liquids and and bulk samples, uh, spectro measure spect the spectrum in the in the near infrared, mid infrared, uh, all the way from maybe uh, one micrometer wavelength to higher uh, wavelengths. So the, the wave number goes, all, goes from up to like, many dips. So in the end, you can get <coughs> The distribution and, the, and you can you can have the the specific peaks the inter the, the infrared peaks for your samples and and you can say what is the composition of your sample so it's a very powerful tool uh, and it's available for anyone to apply if you need to, to work on that. So, for, and now and then we do different things as well, not just research, but we can use light to do art, for example. So uh, a couple of years ago, we entered this project with Luis Rosa Lopez, where he was doing analysis on oak trees. So we did some uh, confocal microscopy images in, in the stems of these oak trees, you see different characteristics, and you can find some images like this one in his uh, blog, uh, which, the, which is the site over there. So, and there is a video and sometimes it, it presents um, all around Portugal and other places. So take a look and it's quite interesting to see his work, his artwork, which is quite different. So, but how to request 
access to our facility. So Iona already told you about being part of INL, but if you're not part of INL, I want to use our system anyway. So you can go to our INL website and, and check for the facilities. And you will see that we have a couple of different facilities. And you can, for instance, if you want to go for our facilities, the nanophotonics and bioimaging, you can see that you can actually contact us via email or either go straight and request a service. So when you request a service, you're going to see a form that you're going to fill up with the, the like, as much information as you can, and we will answer you within five days to keep up the, the, the ISO standards. And depending on what you want and whatever we can do, we will contact you, we will talk, we will have meetings, and we will find the best solution for your problem. If your problem, uh, involves more than one instrument, involves more than one facility. Uh, if you want to do something that's not directly uh, listed in the website, we can try to help you and see if in here at INL, we can do some work for you. So everything can be done this way. So with that, I want to close up my presentations, just saying that uh, visit our website, keep up looking within INL and see how many different things we do around here. Uh, we are part of the Portuguese uh, platform of bioimaging and we are hopefully soon part of the European bioimaging community as well. So let us know if you are part of these communities and if you want to interact with us, we will be more than happy to, to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mariana. Uh, this was a great overview, I'm sure. This was very clear. I don't see a question. There was one question about a device that I already answered. So uh, white light uh, interferometer. I think we don't have a commercial solution, but uh, we can discuss whether some of our sources could be used. Um, we will now um, move to one um, point of the agenda, which is the round table discussion. I will... Um, invite uh, yeah the INA conference office to to put now all our all the panelists on the screen so please put on back your cameras uh Diogo, miguel and maria joan so that we can um yeah have a roundtable discussion together about uh, yeah our a little bit the, the the background why we chose to do research and how it come that we have to do with photonics one or the other and in different ways so i'm um sharing myself and uh will basically um yeah try to to ask some of you i hope my there's not too much background noise because it started to rain a lot here where I am. <laughs> so, Iona, I just want to do a last minute comment because yes. people are asking me about my background. So, actually, this background is a confocal image of, um, of a microstructure made with the technique that Beatrice presented. So, it is made in our confocal in the spectral imaging mode. So that's more or less the color, the, the fluorophore fluoresces, the, the non-fluorophore, sorry, the, the polymer fluoresces. So it's just for it's just for fun, but it's a nice image. And and just to tell you that's not computer generated, it's actually a real microscopy image. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, it's a, a fantastic <laughs> work. Uh, we saw one INL logo fabricated already <laughs> today by Miguel, and now one one more um, showing the versatility of yeah laser fabrication on different scales, right? Um, I assume we are now in the panel mode, so you can see all of us. Uh, is this the case? Yes, gallery yes. mode. Yep. Fantastic. So that that is nice. I think yeah, we have researchers here from from different groups at different career stages, and yeah, I'm I'm curious uh, who would like to start, like to answer, like what what brought you to yeah to choose uh, this research uh, career or uh, the specific field of your studies. And did you expect working with light or photonics in your research when, when you chose that? <laughs> Maybe I can ask uh, Maria Joao first. Maybe you can comment a little bit on your background and yeah, what you do now. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm a chemist. I have a first degree in chemistry uh, and a master's degree <clears throat> in chemical analysis and uh, characterization techniques. Uh, before joining INL uh, under this QPY program, I've worked as a researcher in another new technology center. Uh, but I, I, I think I felt I had reached a stage in my career that I felt the need to expand more of my knowledge. Uh, and I had particular interest in this uh, light, inter uh, light interaction with materials and how can light, uh, how light could lead to, to development of new applications. So then I saw the, this open call in the INL website and I right away contact Yana <laughs> uh, with Professor Susanna from chemistry department. And we developed a, a proposal, a PhD proposal and here I am. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your interest and, and uh, really good work. And yeah, I'm curious to hear the others. Um, Diogo, um, how did yeah light-based techniques or photonics actually enter your background? You, you also don't have like immediately a background in, in photonics, but uh, you, you entered, I think, this field more recently. Is this correct? Yes, yes, uh, this is true. I have a background in engineer in electronics engineering and in physics. Um, before INL, I used to work in photometry engineering at the Max Planck Institute for, for Plasma Physics in Germany. Actually, I worked in, in nuclear fusion. And in this field, I mean, there was a lot of diagnostics. I was working mostly in microwave, but there were also laser-based interferometry diagnostics that I was well acquainted with. Um, at INL, I've been working in the um, uh, in integrated micro nanotechnologies group, one of our main research finds is uh, development of MEMS devices and more recently the development of micro optical elements um, to integrate them in sensors. So actually working with light um, in, in this sensor device uh, is it, something that, that, uh, that appeared due to the growing need of these new sensors like LIDAR, for example, um, the, there was this project that uh, we have been working, that finished last year, that we worked the previous three years, uh, that was in, um, in LIDAR and we're developing 2D MEMS mirrors and also diffractive optics. So we gained a lot of knowledge here and now this is way the foundations for uh, future research topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And uh, yeah, if I may ask Miguel how, what is your background, your research background, and how did you <laughs> choose to work in what you do now? Yeah, of course. Well, again, I don't think I work directly with light or, well, not, not direct uh, photonics um, or optical applications, but I guess it's kind of inevitable that you end up using light in one way or another. So my background is I, I've got an integrated master's in biomedical engineering, um, which I got from the University of Porto. Then I worked for uh one year and a half more or less at INEB now i3s in Porto as well and then I moved to the UK where I did my PhD and it was during my PhD that I started working with microfluidics and lab on the chip um I did a very short postdoc on organ on chip um and then there was a position open at INL uh to develop a gut on chip and I thought it would be uh, nice to continue 
learning about organ on ship and that's where, well, I applied, I got the position. Um, then I wrote a project uh, for continuing to work with, with gut on ship. That's how I got my, my individual uh, fellowship and, and I'm here now today. So yeah, that's pretty <laughs> Yeah, congratulations, very good. Um, yeah, then I, I asked Mariana, you also have <laughs> a background yeah, I, in, in different sectors, right? That you have been working. Yeah, I have a very broad background. So I'm not Portuguese, uh, I'm Brazilian. So I'm a physicist by, by undergrad and master's and PhD. So I started quite, quite some time ago and ever since the beginning I was working with optics. But uh, one thing I realized a long time ago, it doesn't matter if I was working in optical communications or a, a bio applications or dentistry or something like that. What is really interesting for me is to use the knowledge and use light to solve problems. So uh, I did my master's in optical communications, a lot of engineering actually. So fiber optics and optical amplifiers. And that time we had a uh, patent and, and a huge project so it was natural my my transition to bio applications because most of the bio applications in optics are based in either military or engineering applications first so i moved to optical coherence tomography so i worked uh, for my phd mostly in that area I had the chance to spend one year as a as a visiting student at MIT in the group that actually developed the OCT, which is a, a tool that most of you might have heard because it's very common nowadays in in ophthalm, ophthalmology to make images of of the retina and 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 many other things it's used but also in cardiovascular and in and in different places in the body depending on on the applications so uh, after my my phd i went for a, to work in a company so i spent three years in an industry in the research and development and during that time i was to develop an oct but end up working a lot and applications for aerospatial development. So uh, it's, it's not the camera that looks at the sky, but the camera that goes into the satellite to look at Earth. So optical design development, I worked, we worked closely with the mechanics uh, in the industry. We had the whole settings to, to make the lenses and to make and to measure it, so to to see the the flatness of the surface and create it and and align the systems, which is not an easy task. Um, after that, I went back to the university, so I stayed in the same city back in Brazil, but uh, working with two photon applications to especially related to photodynamic therapy, which is one of the techniques used to treat cancer. And it's quite used nowadays to treat skin cancer for small lesions. And from that- Yes, uh, and what kept you inspired? Just very shortly, we, we so, will need to so, move. <laughs> it's so many things, so, uh, yeah. and then random lasers, and I came to INL to work with OCT because of mm -hmm. my background. And uh, like, and for some reason, I end up where I am right now in, in the facility in doing what I actually enjoy doing, which is, how can how do I say I playing with these toys because for me these instruments are uh, old people toys and helping people to do their work and to solve problems with whatever I can 
and all the knowledge I can share. And that's my my motivation to 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 work in this area. Yeah, thank you, Mariana. Then um, Beatrice, what was um, inspiring you to yeah to choose yeah. this path? <laughs> um, yeah, shortly um, I'm a biomedical engineer. Uh, my master's was in medical electronics. Um, I did an Erasmus uh, abroad, so uh, I started to work with the photon polymerization during six months. And then I just didn't want to interrupt my work and start uh, all new new work. So I found that in INL, you actually work with two photon polymerization as well. Uh, then this collaboration started, I finished my master there, and then this vacancy opened and I thought it was just perfect to, to keep working with what I've been doing in my masters. So that's yeah, pretty much you. it. <laughs> thank you. Um... Looking at the time, we should start with the quiz session. So I thank you everyone to, to sharing your, your backgrounds. Um, just very shortly, who, who don't, doesn't know my background, I'm also a physicist by training uh, that entered the, the field of optics and um, on a pathway from low temperature single molecule spectroscopy to ultrafast spectroscopy on single molecules and then going to use single molecules to develop microscopy, super resolution microscopies, and at INL exploring the, the huge interdisciplinary um, opportunities that we have and the opportunities to work with nanofabricated samples to, to build new type of microscopies where we work with near fit microscopies and others, always interested in, in working in methods that can be used in, um, in applications uh, for health or diagnostics, or that could help um, in developing innovative, yeah, photonic techniques to to the, the betterment, uh, yeah, of <laughs> of some of the challenges that that we mentioned. Um, to access the quiz now, um, Beatrice will share with us the the code once more in um. the in the chat and I will also put up the earlier slide where we have the QR code so that you can easily uh, join with the with your phone. Um, I already put the link uh, in the chat so thank you very much just click yeah you should be seeing now the the QR code as well so nope. the, not yet no. Okay. Okay, sorry, then I will click through. Um, yeah, there, now you should be able to see the, the code. And um, maybe in the question and answer box, some of you that managed to log in can shortly mention if everything works well and if you are able to join them. Beatrice, you will start this as a host, right? The yeah. quiz, you will participate yourself. Um, are you able to share your screen with us so that we can see the advances of the- Yes, can you just answers? confirm me that you can see the link that I post on the set? I can see it, but I think you shared it only to the host and okay. panelist. Uh, try to share okay. with everyone. Okay. That's... Yeah, it was shared uh, yeah. with yeah. everyone now. Yeah. So um, please try to participate. And Beatrice, can you see how many people are logged in? Uh, we for now, the 13. moment, thirteen already. Okay, yes. and uh, there are seven uh, panelists and twenty-six attendees uh, that are still here. We had then maximum attendance of forty-two in in the beginning before the quiz. I think some locked out. Um, but so, if you see twenty-six, <laughs> or let's say we hope twenty-six, let's say twenty-four participate. Uh, then you would be able to to start. Let's uh, see if we get 20 um, to actively participate in the quiz. And um, are you able to launch the quiz and share the screen? Uh, um, yes. 
And in case you have to participate pressing the answers, we know you can no, no, I won't. Randomly answer with no. the, wrong, the wrong answer. Okay. I won't, I won't. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. 16 so far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Should. We wait uh, one more minute or 30 seconds when my clock goes to 58 we will we will start. Okay. Okay. Okay, Beatrice, I think you can start now. Yes, I will start with this now. number. Yes. <laughs> what is the official language at INL? Maybe um, show the full question, uh, sorry, uh, the participants view. Time's up, we can go, go to, to the, the next, next question. Leaderboard. <laughs> <laughs> Philippa is leading with Helena second place. Yeah. 13 were correctly answering English, okay? Yeah. What is done mainly at INL? Can we see the questions? Okay. Nanotechnology, research and development for benefit of society, organization of scientific and educational events, arts and graphic design for technical instruments or software development. Philippe still first, second again, Helena. Yeah, one hundred percent accuracy. Still <laughs> thirteen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then I guess it was the one clicking fastest. What is a hologram? A rare shiny Pokemon card or Panini sticker? Digital three D projection technology to see late artists in concerts? Record of the interference pattern used to modulate a light field wavefront, or a 3D technology where images are formed by high speed rotating light strips. Okay, some change, but let's see. Okay. Yes, it's starting to diversify. Yeah, start to getting answers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fourth question. What happens when light shines through a surface relief diffractive optical element? The individual light rays are bent. The face of the wavefront is modulated by the microtopography, or the incident light beam is split into multiple beams, or the intensity of the light beam is amplified. Oh, -ho. some change. Tiago yeah. Kiros, <laughs> first, <laughs> please. The two photon polymerization technique does not allow to fabrication of complex structures or requires a thermally responsive material, or usually it allows the fabrication of large structures or it requires a focused laser beam. Uh, Tiago Kirosh leading again. Mm -hmm. Only one wrong answer. For self fluorescence assays, is it? It is essential to apply dyes with different emission wavelengths, use dyes with overlapping wavelengths, use a normal optical microscope, or choose randomly the laser that excites the dye. Okay. 
Okay. Philippe Speck leading and Bet Korn on second. Mm -hmm. How can light be used to fabricate organ on a chip devices? To crosslink a photoresist, making it extremely difficult to dissolve or to make a photoresist soluble to the developer or to cut polymers by laser or all of the above. Okay, nine correct. Mm -hmm. Eighth question. The eighth question out yeah. of 12. Okay. Inflorescence, the phenomenon called Stokes shift means that the wavelength of the emitted photons is always either longer than the wavelengths of the absorbed photons, the same as the wavelengths of the absorbed photons, shorter than the wavelengths of the absorbed photons, or none of the above. Philippe is again leading with Sergio on the second following some diverse answers here. Yeah. The answer was longer. Next question. Which promising electronic energy transfer type has been proven to be present in nature? First energy transfer, quantum coherent energy transfer, incoherent energy transfer or dexter energy transfer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the one that was quantum coherent energy transfer. Only three left. Yeah, maybe the one that puts puts this question can read it. I think this is Maria Schwab. <laughs> Do you want me to read the question? Yes. What dyes used for light harvesting are known to non-covalently attach to DNA duplexes form well-organized aggregates? Cyanines, coumarines, porphyrins, or quantum dots? And the answer is... I guess this is Mariana. <laughs> you bet you are muted. Who can have access to the INL facilities and its instruments? Anyone can come to INL and use the instruments. Any researcher after requesting via website and receiving training or only researchers from INL, member states, Portugal and Spain, or only INL staff. Okay, seven got it right. Correct with any researcher any requesting, yes. Yeah. Okay, last one, guys. Let's go. <laughs> Mariana, do you want to read your question? Oh, out of voice. Uh, three techniques offered by the nanophotonics and bioimaging user facilities are either ECG, flow cytometry, flow sense lifetime imaging microscopy, or dynamic light scattering, EEG, confocal Raman microscopy, or TERF, confocal microscopy, and atomic force microscopy, or Super resolution microscopy, D storm, OCT, and scanning electron microscopy. Okay, it's time to reveal the winner. It is indeed uh, turf confocal and AFM, and four got it right. So it was actually a difficult question. Mm -hmm. And the main winner <laughs> mm -hmm. will be announced soon. Yes. No. Uh, do you want to end it? Yes, right? Okay. I 
guess, that we ended and get uh, the results. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, First, I, I think the members of the Agrafast Bio and Nanotechnics <laughs> group had a certain advantage. <laughs> These were all from the same group. Uh, there is Philippe Camaredo, who probably it was Philippe <laughs> Camaredo, <laughs> who won the first prize. And um, the first prize is a beautifully illustrated um, international cook recipe book that was developed by INL researchers that will yeah, be shipped to you. So if we don't have your address we will yeah be asking it but i think we know <laughs> we can bring it to your desk probably thank you very much for participating um thank you very much to um all the participants today the speakers and uh, attendances um i will continue sharing my screen for the yes i will probably this will stop your screen sharing. One moment. So, oops. sorry. Oh, I think I'm going just to the last slide, which is a big thank you in different languages. Maybe we can remember the thank you in different languages. Uh, by on our own but what i wrote here was obrigada gracias grazie danke merci tak shishie and shukran so thank you everyone for for participating and um, i hope you enjoyed uh, the international day of light 2022 as much as i did and um, hope to see you soon again bye Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Next year. Mm -hmm.